Let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to come together to worship you, to experience your presence, and to get to know you deeper, Lord. We pray that you'd bless the sermon. We pray that you'd teach us wisdom. Uh, we pray that we would understand more about parenting and understand more about you as our Father. We pray that you'd equip us with wisdom for life and, uh, and that you would bless all the children in this church. We thank you for your grace and amen. amen. So today we are continuing our series called The Essentials of Effective Parenting. And I do want to, uh, to point out again that this series is not just for parents or even just for married couples. It's also uh, for singles and for married couples who aren't parents. And even if you think you'll never be a parent, statistically speaking, more than 50% of humans, even in America, become parents. And a lot of them don't expect to. So just keep that in mind, that, that it is a possibility. And, uh, and moreover, even if you never become a parent, a lot of principles, at least in today's message, are generally useful about loving people, which we are all called to do. So anyways, in this series, The Essentials of Effective Parenting, there's eight different essentials we're going to look at in detail. Loving your children, disciplining your children, evangelizing your children, discipling your children, equipping your children, empowering your children, leading your children by example, and praying for your children. And for each one of these eight essentials, we're going to look specifically not just at how to do them, but how to do them well. And uh, I really want us to see each of these essentials of uh, effective parenting as spectrums, not as binary matters. Uh, the question isn't, do I love my child? It's how consistently do I love my child and how clearly do I communicate that love to them? So anyways, today's sermon is titled, Loving Your Children Well, Part 2. Last week we did Part 1, and we talked about how much your children will be impacted and how much it's going to affect them, uh, how well you love them, and how well you express that love to them, how clearly you communicate it, uh, whether or not they feel like you love them. And just because you love them doesn't mean they feel like you love them, especially because no one's perfectly consistent in loving your kid. Um, so if you didn't get to hear that, I would recommend you listen to it on YouTube or Spotify or our website. So what do I mean by love? I figure I may as well spell that out in these sermons uh, because love is kind of ambiguous in American English. But there's three things that I mean for the purpose of this sermon um, when talking about love. Desiring their well-being with, with a sacrificial level of commitment to their well-being. Delighting in them and desiring to have relationship or fellowship with them. And these three aspects of love are all aspects of God's love for, for us, for his children. God desires our well-being and is sacrificially committed to it. God delights in us, and God desires fellowship with us. He desires intimacy with us. And as parents, it's good that we reflect God's love to our children. So again, last week we talked about the impact of loving your children, how big of a difference it makes. Um, so th this week we're just going to talk about loving them well, and next week we'll talk about communicating your love well, because you know, loving your children in your heart and communicating that love to them are two different things. They're related, but they're, they're different things, and you want to excel at both. Uh, it's more commonly thought about how in a marriage, you know, one spouse might love the other spouse, but the other spouse doesn't feel loved. But that can happen in any relationship, and it's actually pretty common in parenting. It's pretty common for children to not quite receive the parent's love how the parent thinks they do. So it, these are both important, that you actually love them well in your heart and that you communicate that love to them well. So let's talk about loving your child well in your heart. And you might think that, like, well, loving your children in your heart, that's just natural. It's just the default human setting. Well, we're going to see in the scriptures, it actually isn't, um, believe it or not. But let's, you know, we all struggle with selfishness. And having Christ-like love for your children is not the default human setting. 
It's not what the human heart defaults to. But let's get into how to, how to excel at desiring the well-being of your children and being sacrificially committed to it. The first thing that's helpful for that is spending time with God. Christ-like love is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something the Spirit produces. Christ-like love isn't something you can have apart from the Holy Spirit. And you become more and more filled with the Spirit as you spend time with God, when you spend time in the Word, when you spend time in prayer, when you spend time in worship. That's how we get more and more filled with the Spirit. So if we want to have Christ-like love for our children, if we want to have a Christ-like desire for their well-being, we should be spending time with God because that helps us to be filled with the Spirit. And also, the more you develop intimacy with God, the more you will naturally have love for those around you. Because by God's grace, uh, for those who have been redeemed by his Spirit, spending time with God makes us more like him. Kind of like how Moses spent time in God's presence up on Mount Sinai, and after you know, days and days of being up there, his face started to glow. Being in God's presence for periods of time cumulatively makes a difference on who you are. It affects you as a person, and it makes you more like him. Not only that, but the more you spend time in God's presence, the more uh, you'll know and experience and understand his love for you. And the more you know his love for you, it'll make it easier to love others. Let's look at 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. The deeper and more powerfully you know God's love for you, the easier and more natural it will be to have love for others. It's hard to have a Christ-like love for others if you don't know God's love for you. So that's the first thing we can do to, uh, to excel in desiring the well-being of our children, is spend time with God. The second thing you can do is resolve in your heart to actively pursue the well-being of your children in every area. I want to look at Philippians 2, verses 3 through 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. How... Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul is saying that... um, that we should treat others as more significant than ourselves, and we should not only pursue our own interests, but their interests. And really, this is the core of what love is, treating others as if they were more important than you and pursuing their interests, their well-being. And Paul wants us to resolve to do this. He tells us to have this as a mindset in life. In resolving to pursue the well-being of others, even above your own, is the core of what love is. And you might not feel like doing it, um, but doing it over time, because actions will affect your feelings, will eventually start to have some level of impact on whether or not you want to do it or feel like doing it. But the core of what love is, is resolving to pursue someone else's well-being above your own or even at the cost of your own. So that's the second thing we can do. Resolve uh, to actively pursue the well-being of our children in every area. The third thing I would recommend, if you want to excel at uh, loving your children, is spend time thinking about what your child's needs actually are. You know, the easiest way to fall into not loving your child well, or to not loving anyone well for that matter, is to be passive about it. One of the easiest ways to end up neglecting one of your child's needs is to assume that there are no major problems at the moment and everything must be going okay. 
You know, my parents failed to meet a lot of de developmental needs that I had, and they were completely unaware of it. But they weren't really looking or thinking about it. You should, be try, you should try to be in touch with how your children are doing, or again, for anyone who you're trying to love. You should try, if you're going to pursue someone's well-being, you should try to have a sense of what state of well-being they're in. If I want to pursue having a clean house, I start off by asking myself, is my house clean? And then I work from there. You need to be active if you're going to love someone. You need to be active if you're going to love your children. And you need to be thinking about what their needs actually are and what, you know, how's life going for them? What do they need? What could they use? How are they feeling? And you should pay attention to how they feel. You know, you can't afford to get too wrapped up in how they feel. But also, you can't go to the other extreme and tell yourself that their feelings are of no importance. God thinks their feelings are important because he commands parents to not provoke their children to anger. So spend time thinking about what your children actually need in, you know, from day to day because it can change day to day and think about how they're doing and think about that regularly. The fourth thing, and probably the one we'll talk about the longest for this section of the sermon, but the fourth thing you can do to excel in loving your children or in pursuing their well-being is to learn to identify and repent of pseudo-love. Now, when I say pseudo-love, I mean desires that you have that you think are love, but that actually aren't. And we all naturally develop these as fallen parents. And that's because we still struggle with sin and our hearts are deceitful. Let's look at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? The human heart is deceitful and it, it produces imitations of God's love. The biggest threat you have to having a Christ-like love for your child is the pseudo-love that your heart naturally produces, or desires that look like desires for their well-being, but are actually really just desires um, for something in their life that are more for your sake than for their sake. It's very easy to have good desires for other people that aren't really for their sake, they're for your sake. Jesus warned about the dangers of pseudo-love. Let's look at Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So it's possible to do good for others not for their sake, but for your sake. Jesus is giving an example of, you know, the Pharisees frequently fell into doing good for others, but they had no regard for the well-being of those they were doing good to. They were just doing it for their sake. They were doing it so they would be honored by others. But this issue goes even deeper than this. Even the desires you have for, like, your children to succeed, even those desires might not actually be motivated by care for your child's well-being. They might be, but they might not be. They might be motivated so that you can receive honor from others. And the human heart is deceitful and self-centered. So that's something that's very easy to fall into. It's very natural to desire good things for your kids for your sake. The human heart just naturally does it. The sin nature naturally produces it. So 
So let's try to give some examples of pseudo-love that parents might have. Um, desiring your children's success more for your sake than for theirs. That's, that's a, a very common type of pseudo-love that parents get tempted to have. Desiring your children's success more for your sake than for theirs. It's very easy to desire a great uh, future for your kids for very self-centered reasons, for your comfort, for your pride, or so that others think well of you. Because generally, if your children become very successful, it's going to help with those things. It probably will bring you comfort. It'll probably make you feel better about yourself. It, it might cause others to think better of you. And there's a certain natural amount of desire we have to pursue good futures for our kids, but don't just assume that all desire to pursue a good future for your kids is out of love for them or is for the sake of their well-being. It might be, but it might not be. You know, God tells us in Proverbs 4 to watch over your heart with all diligence. Your heart produces deceitful desires and uh, in a you know, you should be watching over your desires and evaluating them. Is this a godly desire? Is this not? What's the motive behind this? Why do I really want this? What do I really want in this situation? It might be Christ-like love for your child, or it might be pseudo-love. But a hint that a desire that you have for them to have a good future is more for your sake than for theirs is if even... Um, even though you're pursuing their future, you don't pursue their interests in other areas. You know, this is a, a common trope uh, in America, but like a husband or a father who says, I'm going to work really hard to give my kids all the chances I never had, but once I get home, I want them to shut up and give me the peace I deserve. And I want to have it my way. A parent with that attitude should question whether or not they're actually pursuing their child's future for their sake. I'd say they're not, or I'd bet that they're not. Are they really pursuing their child's future for their child's sake, or is it out of selfishness? And at best, even if it's not pseudo-love, it's incomplete love. It's love mixed with selfishness. But honestly, in that example, it's probably pseudo-love. It's probably just pursuing their future so they can feel better about themselves. Let's give a few more examples of pseudo-love. Uh, Overprotecting your children because it brings you pain to see them suffer. You might think that all your desires to protect your children are love. They might not be. Christ, so God has godly love for, God the Father has godly love for God the Son, because he's God, and he crucified the Son for the Son's sake. That's worth thinking about. So Christ-like love is willing to cause pain and to allow pain. Christ loves his church, and he allows his church to suffer a fair amount of pain. Again, but he works, it, he works it all together for our good, and he allows it for our sake. But not all the protecting that parents do or to, to desire, they desire to do for their children is out of love. Sometimes it's just out of desire to not suffer emotional turmoil ourselves when we see our children in pain. And that's an easy thing to do. And, but the true test of this uh, is when a parent has to do things uh, or when the child has to go through things that are painful but necessary, necessary for their well-being. Are the parents willing to allow it? If our desire for them to not have pain truly comes out of a desire for their well-being, then allowing them to suffer for their sake or for the sake of their well-being should be natural, as long as we actually are convinced that it's good for them. You know, if you're not really convinced that um, some necessary aspect of suffering is really necessary, then that's different. But if a parent's actually convinced uh, that a certain amount of suffering is necessary, then allowing it should be natural if, if they have Christ-like love for their child. Let's look at Proverbs 13, verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, 
but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Disciplining your children causes pain. But a parent who loves their child, who has Christ-like love, is diligent to discipline them. And if we really love our kids, uh, we'll be even willing to cause them pain that's for their well-being, as long as we're convinced that that, willing, uh, that that suffering is necessary. So that's another type of pseudo-love that parents get tempted to have for their children, um, overprotecting their children just out of desire to not see them suffer. Another type of pseudo-love that parents get tempted to have is uh, being upset more for your sake than for theirs when they're not reaching their full potential. You know, every child is going to fail to reach their potential in some points of their lives. Sometimes they uh, make big mistakes or fall into bad sins. You know, an example that I have of this is, you know, if you find out that your kid has done drugs or watched porn, it's easy to be mad But often parents are mad not so much out of desire for their children's spiritual well-being, but more because of how bad it makes us look and how much they've disrespected us by doing those things that we've spent years and years telling them not to do. And you might just assume, oh, it's godly anger because it's anger towards sin. But you can't just assume that. It might be godly anger. It might not be. It depends on what motivates it. Why are you upset that they did this? Are you upset because they're not uh, having a healthy relationship with God, or are you upset because they insulted you and disrespected you and made you look bad? It might be godly anger, or you might be offended for personal reasons. So those are just three examples of how parents get tempted to have pseudo-love for their children. But all parents get tempted to have pseudo-love for their children, and it's very subtle. It's very subtle. You have to be looking for it if you're going to see it. Or unless the Holy Spirit just really points it out to you. But the biggest danger to having a Christ-like love for your children is pseudo-love, which your heart is going to naturally produce. <clears throat> the reason it's a hindrance... <clears throat> sorry. The reason it's a hindrance to Christ-like love is because it keeps you from seeing where you don't have a Christ-like love for your children. <clears throat> and this is a... Hang on. And this is going to be a common struggle for every parent. And it's, it's like a major thing in the United States. Fake love is everywhere. Hollywood is all about it. So many movies are about how much people love each other, and it's really about how much they desire to uh, get enjoyment out of this other person. Fake love is everywhere in the media. It's all over the place. And, you know, we can't fault the world for that. They don't have Christ-like love. But again, you know, the sin nature naturally produces all kinds of cheap imitations of God's love. And as a parent, you're going to struggle with having cheap imi- Your sin nature is going to produce cheap imitations of God's love towards your child. Imitations that are more about you and your desires than they are about your child's well-being. But you can have a, a real godly love for them that's not an imitation of God's love, but the real thing. But for that to happen, it has to originate from the Holy Spirit working within you. So we need to learn to identify and repent of pseudo-love, but I, I do want to point out when it comes to repenting of pseudo-love, the solution isn't necessarily to stop doing the thing you're doing. For example, if you find out that, you know, you've been pursuing your child's future for a while and then you find out you've really just been motivated by pride, the proper way to repent is not to stop pursuing their future. 
the proper way to repent of that is to ask God to change your motives and to keep pursuing their future, to keep pursuing their well-being. But it also depends on how pseudo-love is expressing itself. Because if your issue with pseudo-love for them is that you don't discipline them because you're unwilling to see uh, them be in pain, then the solution is to change what you're doing. But either way, you should pray that God would reveal to you any areas where you have pseudo-love for your children, and you should ask him to empower you to have Christ-like love for them. So that is the uh, fourth way we should pursue having desire for our children's well-being. Uh, the fifth one <clears throat> is to pray that God would help you to do a good job of loving your children and pray that he would give you uh, his desire for their well-being. You know, on any list I have of how to pursue something, prayer is always going to be on it. You should be praying for everything you plan on doing in life because we are to live life in a manner of reliance on God. God wants us to rely on him. God wants us to pray. And you should be praying that God would give you Christ-like love for your children, that God would put his desires for your children into your heart. And that he would help you to love them like he does. So that's um, all I have to say on how we can pursue having Christ-like desire for our children's well-being. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, and we'll move through this quickly. We can get this done in 10 minutes. Uh, but delighting in them. Delighting in your children is something you should do as a parent. But it's not always natural, especially when they're being rebellious. And some parents have develop a struggle to delight in their children. So what can you do to delight in your children? Because that's part of reflecting God's love to them, is delighting in them. So I'm going to mention three things you can do to kind of pursue delighting in them or to, to help you delight in them. The first one is work on having a full grasp of grace. When I say having a full grasp of grace, I mean having a deep understanding of God's grace towards you. People who understand how much they need God's grace and how gracious God is towards them are more naturally inclined to be gracious to others. If you see yourself as a pretty good person, and then your child sins, you won't easily sympathize. But if you see yourself as a person who's deeply in need of God's grace, and then you see, oh, my child is also deeply in need of grace, then it'll be easy and natural to sympathize with them. And having a gracious attitude towards them is going to make a difference in how much you delight in them. Having a gracious attitude towards others makes it easier to delight in others. Because a non-gracious attitude causes you to have high demands of others. And it's hard to delight in people when you have high demands of them, and because of those high demands, they're inevitably, inevitably going to disappoint you. Having a non-gracious attitude also makes it easier to become bitter with people. And nothing will make it harder to delight in someone than being bitter at them. So work on having a deep understanding of God's grace. The second thing I would recommend to help you delight in your children is to discipline your children. Amen. Let's look at Proverbs, 19, 7, uh, Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. So Solomon makes a clear connection between disciplining your kids and having delight in your kids. Let's also look at Proverbs 19, verse 18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. That sounds pretty severe. But uh, he's kind of saying, you know, discipline your children while there's hope. Don't let things get so out of hand that you give up hope on your children. And disciplining them makes a difference. It's going to affect how much you delight in them, whether you believe it or not. Because without discipline, children naturally develop bad character. And children with bad character are harder to delight in. 
you know, children who are rude, children who are rebellious, children who are lazy. And those are human default conditions. Rude, rebellious, and lazy, that's humanity. But discipline helps with those issues. Let's look at Proverbs twenty-two, fifteen. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. So again, uh, even though this might seem counterintuitive, whether or not you discipline your children is going to affect how much you delight in your children. You want to discipline them in healthy ways and in an appropriate amount, not too much and not too little, but if you don't discipline your children, that will make it harder to delight in them, inevitably. The third thing I want to say for, um, that can help delighting in your children is have a balance in the relationship. Uh, I should explain what I mean by that. Don't always sacrifice what you want for what they want. So you should put their interests ahead of your interests, like we looked at in Philippians, but don't always sacrifice what you want for what they want. Sometimes you should refrain uh, from giving them what they want, even if what they want isn't bad for them, simply because it might get in the way of what you want. You shouldn't do that all the time, but you need balance. Because if you're always sacrificing your desires for the sake of their desires, you might actually grow to resent them and their desires. And you might... um, You might get the idea that it's loving to get them what they want whenever it's possible, but be assured, if it's driving you to resent them, it's not working out for their sake. It's not working out for their well-being. It's not in their best interest that you resent them. That's very bad for them. There's a a Jordan Peterson quote I saw recently that I kind of liked, where he said, don't let your kids do anything that makes you dislike them. That's, that's kind of reasonable advice um, if you think about it and take it the right way. But I'll try to give an example. So it's good to play games with your kids. But let's say there's a certain game that you just personally don't enjoy. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not sinful. It's not dangerous. You just don't like it. It's not fun for you whatsoever. But it's their favorite game. And they frequently ask you to play it. I'd say it's good to play that game with them sometimes, but if you really don't like it, don't play it all the time just because they want to. Especially if it's bringing you to resent playing with them. It would be much better for their sake, for their well-being, if you found a different game that they might not enjoy as much, but that you don't, doesn't make you dislike playing with them. And again, you might get the idea that playing the game you hate but they love whenever it comes time to play with them is the loving thing to do, but I'd say it isn't. Because sooner or later, it's going to inevitably lead you to not really enjoy playing with them. And that's not in their best interest. But again, you need to have balance. You shouldn't ignore all the games that they want to play with you just because you don't like those games. You should love them sacrificially. And you should pursue their interests. But you, you should have some balance. So those are uh, three tips on, that hopefully will help you to have a, a strong delight in your children. And I, I would give some tips on desiring to have relationship with them, but I'm not really going to talk about that too much because it would really overlap with uh, delighting in them a lot. And if you have... Um, a strong desire for their well-being, and you delight in them. You're just naturally going to want fellowship with them. So we're kind of going to leave that one out. So that brings us to our conclusion. Um, We didn't talk about this too much this week, but we did last week. But I want to emphasize it again. It's important that you love your children well. It's, It's one of the biggest things that's going to determine how they turn out as an adult, is what kind of love you have for them, and how you communicate that love to them. It's, it's going to be one of the biggest determiners of how they grow up and who they turn into. And the second point of my conclusion is you need God's empowerment in order to have Christ-like love for your children. The human heart does not naturally produce Christ-like love. Even parents, their hearts doesn't, don't naturally produce Christ-like love for their children. 
You need the Holy Spirit in order to have Christ-like love for your children. The human heart naturally produces selfish love for your children, just like it produces selfish love for your spouse. It produces desire to use them for your sake. So let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our communion meditation. Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are the perfect Father, and you love us with a, a Christ-like love. You, you love us for our sake, and you genuinely desire our well-being. We pray that you'd help us to have a, a godly love for our children, and we pray that, uh, that you would just uh, bless our relationships with our children. We thank you for your grace, and amen. Today's communion meditation is called Jesus Does the Impossible by Saving Us. So breaking free from sin is not something we could ever do on our own. Let's look at Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also uh, can do good who are accustomed to do evil. That's pretty straightforward. God is basically saying, it's impossible for you to change and become accustomed to obeying me. And we might think to ourselves that we don't really have that deep of a struggle of sin and we could just get over it if we tried uh, a bit harder and we're not really in desperate need of a savior. But those thoughts are deceitful thoughts. Apart from the saving work of Jesus, we are bent on not fully submitting to God and we're also bent on convincing ourselves that that's not that big of a deal. Convincing ourselves that, oh, I, I think I obey him in most areas. I'm good. We're bent on convincing ourselves of that. But Jesus is capable and willing to change our hearts by his miraculous grace, his grace that can do the impossible, so that we actually desire to fully submit to God. Let's look at Romans 7, verses 21 through 25. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Sin is something we could never overcome on our own, but Jesus has miraculous resurrection power that can work in our hearts to redeem us and to set us free from sin. And he has the grace to forgive us of all the areas that we don't fully overcome. And, and you know, we'll never fully overcome sin, but let's praise him as we come to the table.